And so we're going to do that, and then we're going to have a, a, the Pledge of Allegiance and then a prayer. So if you would, uh, uh, please stand. And I'm going to ask for a special privilege here today. So uh, uh, I have uh, my daughter and my grandson are going to sing the National Anthem for us.
here, Local 23, Hotel and Food Service Workers in Denver. Steelworkers Organization for Active Retirees, District 12, I'm from Pueblo. Retired from, retired from Local 2102. I see this truck over here on the side of here. <laughs> Josette Hanamio, president of the Colorado AFL CIO, uh, home local AFSCME. Brotherhood of Teamsters, local 455 at Denver, Colorado. Mike Williams, Painters and Allied Trades, local 79 out of Denver, and Secretary Treasurer of Colorado, the NFL Steel. Pico, uh, Steel Workers, local 3267, also out of Pueblo. Yeah.
with the president of the Flight Attendants uh, Association of Flight Attendants. Uh, give her a hand. Our first speaker uh, comes to us from, uh, she lives up in Colorado Springs now, and uh, uh, she uh, obtained her doctor's degree. Her name is Dr. Erica Wills. Uh, she is from the Labor Study. She's a faculty professor who has written and taught on the Lindo Massacre. Uh, Dr. Wills teaches for the labor movement throughout the Western United States, Mexico, and Canada. Her work often focuses on history, organizing, and current bargaining in the tri-national copper, silver, and gold mining industries. She lives in Colorado Springs, as I said, with her children and husband. And she also, her husband actually is an attorney who also works for the labor movement. If you want to please welcome uh, Dr. Erica Wills. It's amazing to see so many people from so many different unions here today. And I am so honored to be able to speak at this event. The first time that I came to Ludlow was in 2012, and it was actually my first time in Colorado. And I was here studying the Colorado Coalfield Wars and their relationship to the Rockefeller-owned CF&I steel mill in Pueblo, Colorado, which we have some people here representing. So at that time, I was raising two young children, I was working on my doctorate, and I was just beginning my work in the labor movement. So now it's just a couple years later, my family's actually decided to move to Colorado. We live here. Uh, I finished my dissertation, and I'm really proud to have a chapter about Ludlow in that dissertation. But what I'm most proud about is the on-the-ground work that I've been able to do for the labor movement, because that's just priceless. Along with my work as a labor studies professor, I also work with the United Steelworkers, who represent copper and silver miners in the western United States. And we've created an amazing program with Los Mineros, who's the Mexican union that represents miners and steel workers in Mexico, uh, to work across borders to counter transnational corporations' global attack on workers with shared strategies and shared solidarity. And I've learned more through these experiences than I could ever learn in any book. Because one thing that I didn't know the first time I came to Ludlow is that Ludlow is not just a moment in history. Ludlow is a changing, evolving, real-life parable for our current moment. And so that is how I'm going to talk about Ludlow today. From where we're sitting and standing, we can see the railroad tracks, they're right over there, that were so important in providing temporary cover from Colorado National Guard gunfire when a train slowed along them and the men, women, and children could seek shelter. And now that I live in Colorado, I've heard stories in Southern Colorado about the men and women who took their children and they put them on the boxcars of those slowing trains, hoping to get them to safety. For too many of those parents and children, that's the last time they saw each other. And I think about those children alone in those metal box cars. And I think about those parents praying for the safety of their children. So I can't help but be reminded of what's happening in our borders today. From those children torn away from their parents. Those mothers that hear the cries of their nursing babies in the next room. Those children taken for baths and never returned to their parents. The tent town constructed in Texas, like the tent town here at Ludlow, a tent town to house those stolen children. Speaking to United Mine Workers Convention on April 30th, 1914, Labor advocate Mother Jones talked about the bloody events that had, had unfolded at Ludlow only days before. And this is what she said. The horrors of it cannot be depicted by human pen or penned into the history to come. How many people in the United States grasp the horror of the thing? The poor children that were roasted to death at Ludlow, their voice 
is coming to you. And I say someday we will find that they did not die in vain. They died for a great cause in a great battle. Those are Mother Jones's words. And when we think of historical labor struggle, we often remember the men who put their lives on the line to become union members and who sacrificed their bodies against the oppression that was intolerable and inhumane of the company towns and the working conditions. But they couldn't have done it alone. And so as we are here today, we must remember the women and children. As Mother Jones said, their voices are coming to you. Those women and children sustained this strike from their economic role, delicately hand-tatting lace to sell for money, to their advocacy role, forcefully marching through the streets of Trinidad demanding the release of Mother Jones. They put their bodies on the line from being beaten by National Guardsmen on horseback when they marched to as historical documents reveal, being repeatedly raped by mine guards during and before the strike. And through it all, these women still cared for and took care of their families. They fed them with preserved food, put in those hand-dug root cellar-like pits, those pits that became their hand-dug graves. The women did essential work in life, and through their death, they memorialized and amplified the labor struggle, both sides of sacrifice and service to the rights of workers. And I'm drawn back into the present. I think about the women here and around the globe who put their bodies on the line. When they enter situations where they face physical assault on picket lines, giving speeches, educating, and advocating. We vaguely realize the risk of attack, the bruises, the cuts, the beatings. We don't talk much about how these women face not only physical attacks, not only sexual harassment like touching or looks or comments, but also how women face bodily danger of sexual assault used as a physical and ideological tool as much as any fist to the face. And I wonder, how far have we really moved away from Ludlow? Where those women at Ludlow, they put their bodies on the line and they were beaten, battered, and burnt. Such physical scars are not badges of honor. Such emotional wounds are not character building. They are constant reminders of injustice, objectification and reification, too often sexualized and racialized, of what power struggle in this country really looks like and really feels like when we are willing to fight for a cause. It's not a new cause. It's what Mother Jones called a great cause in a great battle. We fight for the same type of basic labor demands and human rights that the Ludlow strikers felt the pain of standing up and demanding. The same pain of bullets tearing through flesh, of smoke slowly suffocating lungs. The same pain on April 20th, 1914 as on April 20th, 2006. As I said, I do work with Los Mineros, the mining union in Mexico, and I was recently in Mexico for a memorial commemorating men who were murdered by government forces in Lazaro Cardenas on April 20th, 2006, exactly 92 years after Ludlow. Instead of, like at Ludlow, National Guard shooting down on strikers from a ridge, in Lazaro Cardenas, the strikers were shot down on by government helicopters circling overhead. Two men, Alberto Rodriguez Castillo and, Her and Hector Alvarez Gomez, died with bullets to the brain that day. The Los Mineros miners cannot be with us here today as much as they want to. 
as much as they should be able to come to this country without fear for events such as this. But when I taught them about Ludlow in Mexico a few weeks ago, they desperately wanted me to convey their message that our labor history, that this fight at Ludlow, that they fight to keep it alive because it's their history too. Like in Lazaro Cardenas where strikers were murdered from circling helicopters. Like in Canada, Mexico at the Buena Vista Copper Mine where families have sustained an 11 year labor dispute. Today, in and around the town, Grupo Mexico's disregard for health and safety has caused preventable industrial and ecological disasters that has left much of the region's water undrinkable and poisonous. But we haven't sat down for that. What did we do? We went to Mexico, we joined with Los Mineros, we joined with farmers in the area, we occupied the mine and we shut it down. They share our history, like in Pasta de Conchos, where a preventable mine explosion left, the, left 95 miners dead. But instead of retrieving 63 of those miners' bodies for proper burials, for their families to grieve, instead, Grupo Mexico simply sealed the mine shaft with concrete, and they walked away. When Los Mineros General Secretary Napoleon Gomez Arruda called this an act of industrial homicide, he and his family became so persecuted that fearing for their life, they had to seek asylum in Canada from where he still leads Los Mineros. And most recently, just this year at the Torax Gold Mine in Guerrero, Mexico, three union leaders were murdered were killed, were shot in just as many months when they stood up and they demanded an independent union, not the company union being shoved down their throats. So just as the fight at Ludlow brought immigrants and different ethnicities together in a common cause, a border is not enough to separate our global labor movement when we know that these struggles still exist. A militarized boundary is not enough to separate us. A wall is not enough to separate us because we share the same struggles. And the success of each of us depends upon the success of all of us. Mother Jones said to remember the dead and fight like hell for the living. And so just as we will not let unjust immigration policy go unnoticed, we will fight like hell against the recent U.S. Supreme Court ruling that's kicked workers out of court and brought back the old yellow dog contracts by upholding mandatory arbitration agreements as a condition of employment. We will fight like hell to preserve public as well as private unions, regardless of the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling on Janus and union freeloading. We will fight like hell against any and all acts of industrial homicide in the United States and around the world. And we should be assured that that fight is so much bigger than just those of us here today. Those who couldn't be with us, faculty I work with, my family in Illinois, my friends in the labor movement around the world, they've asked me to say a prayer for them on this sacred day at this sacred place. And so let us remember the children sent away from Ludlow in boxcars bound for safety, and the children in lonely limbo at our borders today. Let us remember the men, women, and children who died here on April 20th, 1914, and the labor advocates who in this country and around the world still face physical and sexual harassment and assault when they stand up and demand their rights. Let us remember the Los Mineros miners dying for their right to join an independent union. And let us praise the workers 
here and around the world who sacrifice every day to establish, preserve, and strengthen the right of all people to have a living wage, a safe workplace, health care, a stable food supply, access to just court systems, freedom from fear and basic human and labor rights. With this in mind, let me conclude with, let's say a slightly updated prayer for our current contemporary moment, based on Matthew 25, verses 35 through 40. For I was hungry and you fed me as you fought for a living wage. I was thirsty and you gave me drink as you demanded clean public drinking water. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home as you embraced me in your country. I was naked and you gave me clothing as you campaigned for affordable housing. I was sick and you cared for me as you confronted access to affordable quality health care. I was in prison and you visited me as you agitated for legal representation and rights. And when you did this, even to one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you were doing this to me. Give us strength. Let us support each other. Amen. In solidarity. here. Uh, a couple things. One, after the ceremony today, we do have a barbecue that will be coming here. Uh, please wait and, uh, you know, we all can break bread together and uh, enjoy uh, each other's company. So uh, keep that in mind that uh, at the end of the service here, we will be having that. In 2009, uh, the Department of Interior, through the National Park Service, declared uh, the Ludlow uh, Monument here as a National Historical Monument. <laughs> and uh, uh, over time, uh, you know, we've been working with the National Park Service, and uh, this last year, as some of you can notice, our salary, the cement and the salaries deteriorating. And we need to do something about it because we want people to access that to, to realize, uh, you know, what to have a feel for what has occurred at that salary. And uh, uh, the National Park Service has, uh, through grants, uh, and we I work with a, a couple of people, a Skyler, Skyler Bueller and a Tom Cohen out of uh, Denver, Colorado, and they've been very great in doing this. Uh, we've been able to acquire a $20,000 grant from the National Park Service, the Department of Interior, for the salary. And also, uh, many years ago here in the state of Colorado, we uh, approved uh, limited state gambling in three uh, uh, mining towns, uh, Cripple Creek, Black Hawk, and Central City. And uh, part of the funds from that is uh, they set up what they call the State Historical uh, Fund, and that money is used also to uh, preserve historical historical sites and such. So, uh, and uh, pleased to announce that last year they awarded us twenty thousand dollars to uh, repair the cellar. So, uh, you know, please thank them. So that's a that's a project that. Uh, you know, we'll be undertaking. Matter of fact, we start next week. Uh, we're going to excavate the, the ground to see the condition of the cement from the outside. And we're going to start this process. It's an expensive process, but hopefully at the end, uh, we have something here not only for us to enjoy, but for generations to come to enjoy here at the Lundo site. Our next couple speakers, uh, they're going to kind of double team this here for us. Uh, as I said uh, uh, earlier, um, yesterday we had uh, a service in Trinidad, Colorado, and uh, 
Uh, we, were, we received a call, I would think, uh, Mike, somewhere about a year or so ago from a gentleman by the name of Michael Servos. And uh, he contacted us and said, uh, you know, we want to put a statue somewhere, either at the Ludlow site or in Trinidad, uh, honoring uh, the union organizer who was murdered out here, who was Picus. And uh, so through this and, and through uh, the very hard work by Michael Servos, Servos and his organization, and uh, my brother, uh, Mike Romero, and his wife, uh, that dream come true yesterday. And, and if you get a chance, uh, you know, go down to downtown Trinidad, Colorado, and they've erected a statue of Louis Ticus, and uh, to honor this gentleman who, uh, who was here as an organizer and uh, who uh, uh, died here at this site on April 20th. And also in the crowd today, this is, I believe, our second or third time here, uh, we do have uh, a couple of uh, Louis Ticus' great nephews. I, I apologize, I, do, I don't know the names, but if you would, uh, with his two nephews, please. Now that nephew came all the way from Greece to be with us today. the other nephew, but he, he came all the way from Florida. I'm going to go ahead and turn over the mic. And like I said, these gentlemen had to go out. They had to raise the funds to, to wreck that. Uh, if you've ever tried to uh, raise money for a bronze statue, you, you better have either some deep uh, pockets or you better have a long time because uh, you're, gonna need, you're probably going to need both of them because uh, you need to do that. But uh, again, Louis Kikas died here. The Greek community reached out and uh, put together this. And it's my pleasure now to introduce the gentleman that organizes, Mr. Michael Cervos. And, and I believe uh, uh, the other gentleman, Michael Alexandro, will you please come to the spot? Thank you, bro. My name is Michael Alexandro. I'm the president of the Frank Atlantic Federation of Florida. I came here two days ago to take part in the great celebration and symposium about Louis Tigas and about the unveiling of his statue. In the three days I've been here, I learned a lot of things about unions. I grew up in an environment, a white-collar environment in America, Canada, and the United States, and the word union was an anathema. You do not pronounce it. But here I learned a lot, but the most important thing I learned on the sacred grounds is that oppression and injustice he has not changed over the years. Just the way it's practiced is changed. So stay strong and be strong. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. It's uh, my pleasure to be here in the historic city of uh, Trinidad. It's my pleasure to be here in this historic site. Louis Tickers statue is a benchmark for the working class in America and the coal miners. Louis, Louis Tickers is back. This time is not laid down. Who is <laughs> no. so stand up. And send a message to all the working people and the working class in America that he gave his life and struggle for the American working people and the coal miners. Thank you and God bless you all.
Thank you very much, uh, Michael and Michael. Uh, you know, it was a great honor to be with you yesterday and to uh, to uh, be with you during that service and, and the statue was beautiful. And it means a lot to uh, not only the city of Trinidad, but uh, uh, the labor movement to, uh, in general. Thank you very much. Uh, a couple other, I want to recognize a couple other people here. We do have a, you know, a Tuesday here in uh, uh, Colorado is, uh, is primary day. And uh, of course, most of you were sent uh, mail in ballots, and uh, you have the right to uh, return your ballots and, you know, have them loaded. Um, we do have a couple uh, uh, candidates here. Uh, I see, I don't know if there's any more, but. Uh, uh, running in the Democratic primary for county commissioners, actually one of our local union presidents, uh, uh, Mr. Jojo Martinez. <laughs> Another candidate that's, uh, that's here, uh, a longtime friend of mine, and uh, he's running for uh, the Republican uh, seat in the county commissioner is uh, Mr. Tony Hass. Uh, our, our next speaker, uh, I, I first heard her speak, I uh, was at, uh, we had a rally in, uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, a coal company, uh, multinational, multi-billion dollar uh, energy company was uh, trying to take uh, monies that was uh, basically allocated for, for miners or for the uh, tax dollar and they wanted to get a get a break on all of this and uh, and they were trying to basically steal coal miners uh, health care and uh, we were there at a, at a rally that we had and uh, and this woman was uh, came and spoke and uh, was very instrumental to me I did not get a chance to be here at that occasion but I did meet her this last week and I do uh, uh, I am happy that she did uh, attend and, and, and did agree to uh, speak again, this, speak at this event. Uh, Sarah Nelson is the international president of the uh, Association of Flight Attendants, uh, part of the CWA uh, organization. She's with the AFL-CIO. She represents uh, over 50,000 flight attendants with the cover that are employed by uh, 20 airlines. She was also a 23-year uh, um, United flight attendant herself. Uh, as most uh, labor people are, they come out of the ranks of, uh, of, of, of their unions. Uh, you know, uh, very few are, you know, outside of that. They are either coal miners or steel workers or uh, restaurant or boiler makers or wherever they come from that they come up out through the ranks so it's not like you know people were so-called born into these jobs or educated into these jobs of such but uh, so uh, she has a, like I said is a 23 year member she's a member of the AFL the CIO's executive council uh, Sarah lives in Washington DC with her husband and her son uh, please welcome International President uh, Sarah Nelson. I am so humbled and grateful to be here with you today. To be a part of remembering the horror of Lobo and also the fighting spirit of the working people that rose out of it. And as Dr. Wells said, this is a story for today. This is what we are living here today. And so we have to recognize that and own this. Never forget this. Never let people just lay down, but have them stand up just as the rest of us is today. You have all been so overwhelmingly welcoming to me this weekend that some might be thinking, what does this have to do with flight attendants? <laughs> and first, every person in this country has a connection to mine workers 
We have told our members that they have this connection because it was the mine workers who dug the coal that lit our cities, warmed our homes, forged the steel that won our wars. Almost all of us were born in hospitals but that were lit and warmed because miners risked their lives underground. And the United Mine Workers of America made it possible for the vast majority of unions to even exist today. Your history is our history. And we hold it as our own. As a wise person sitting over there wrote to me last year. While there are many differences that exist between the members of our union and the industries in which they are employed, there are also blunt similarities. We both work in environments where we are totally dependent on our brothers and sisters to survive. Gravity at 30,000 feet high is the same as gravity 1,600 feet deep, and it will take someone's life indiscriminately. Miners and flight attendants both rely on ventilation systems to ensure breathable air to maintain life. We have these connections, but we also know only one thing matters. There are those of us who work and those of us who profit from the work that we do. We know which side we are on. I'll never forget my first week on the job when my flying partner of 35 years told me, listen, management thinks of us as their wife or their mistress, and in either case, they hold us in contempt. Your only place of work is with your flying partners. We're your union pin, and if we stick together, there's nothing we can't do. That was jarring as a 23-year-old bright-eyed person who thought I was just getting the keys to the world. Sandy Canales, whose grandfather was a Ludlow striker, is one of the flight attendants who worked 45 years alongside her flying partners to define our careers. She was with us yesterday for the unveiling of the statue, and she, all, her daughter brought a dance troupe to show us some great dancing. With Sandy and the other brave women who formed my union, we'd be back incredible discrimination that included stepping on the weight scale before flying up until even 1993. We gained safety and health protections and confirmed our role as aviation's first responders. Mother Jones told us, Rockefeller and his gang of thieves made the ladies, but God Almighty made women. <laughs> organized, claimed our place as women, and even fought for men to have the same rights as women on the job. <laughs> Corporate executives today don't turn on us with guns and clubs and bombs. They let their supporters in Congress and in the state houses across the country do their dirty work. They use lawyers to try to strip us of our rights. And as long as we believe our issues are unique and social issues are not also economic issues, they will get away with it. There is a law of this land, and it starts with the words, we the people. Not we the corporations, not we the multi-corporations, not we, we with all the money and power. We are working every day to make that law ring true because it has yet to fulfill the promise that it was given hundreds of years ago. And we live by another law. We live by God's law. To love one another. Love is not something laid upon a rose leaf with sugar tongs, says a woman who wrote at the turn of the century. I make strong demands on love call for active witnesses, noble sacrifices, and grand achievements as its results. So that means that love is adversity too. If we're not willing to fight for love, then what is it? I am proud of the flight attendants who this past week stood up and said, I will not take part in moving children away from their families. to say to the government, 
We want no part in your dirty work to try to separate families and create cruelty so that we can make America a place that is isolated from the world rather than a place where we have our arms open wide for the promise of freedom. So speaking of laws, I took part in United Airlines bankruptcy, 38 month long bankruptcy, and at the time I was doing our communications. And early on in the bankruptcy, we were in the middle of emergency wage cuts and base closures and thousands of people on furlough. And I was down in my office working as many hours of the day I could possibly work to communicate on this and try to do what we could to help people. And the president called me down to my office. He said, stop what you're doing. I need to talk to you. I just got a call from United Airlines and they are going to furlough another 2,500 people. And in that moment, I said, Mr. President, I just I had to take a minute to cry. Because it was too much. And I did cry for a minute. And then I said to him, you know what, I am done crying. We have to fight like hell to hang on to every single thing that we can in this damn bankruptcy so that we can live to fight another day for what these people deserve. That summer, 2,600 flight attendants decided to retire when only 2,500 flight attendants in our history have, had ever retired from the company. They decided to retire because the company promised that if they retired by a certain date, they would keep their old health care in the contract because we had to make some concessions on the health care plan for retired medical. So these people retired, and two months later, the CFO came back and said, oh, we made an accounting error, so we need to take that health care too, after these people had left their jobs. <laughs> we said, oh no, we leave no one behind in our union. And we formed a coalition with the rest of the retirees, and we fought this management. And I took six retirees, marched over to corporate headquarters, Someone pulled a fire alarm, I don't know how that happened. And <laughs> we marched into the CEO's office and kept him captive while everyone was outside the fire alarm. <laughs> and he had to listen to these six retirees talk about what this was going to do to them. Talk about why they decided to retire and give up a career that they loved years before they were planning to do it because they had to take care of themselves or their family members who had severe health conditions. We fought, and we fought in a bankruptcy where everything is against us, and we won. And we kept affordable health care that was promised to those retirees. <laughs> A year later, a year later, we're still in bankruptcy. And the company comes back and says, well, now we've got to take the pensions. And at the time, this was just after George Bush had failed to privatize secure, Social Security. So they turned on defined benefit pension plans. That is what happened. This had nothing to do with anything more than moving more money to Wall Street to put more money in the hands of those with all the money and power. And so we fought this too. We fought hard because our pension plan had the law behind it that said that but for the total destruction of the company, the pension plan can stay in place. And our pension plan was still affordable. We had a plan to have just an $80 million contribution to keep that pension plan in place. <coughs> but Management went into the bankruptcy court with a deal to wrap all <laughs> the pension plans into one and to pay the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation $1.5 billion to terminate the plans. And George Bush's PBGC agreed. And the bankruptcy court approved it. Approved that when $80 million would have saved the pension for almost 30,000 pensioners when $400 million was awarded in bankruptcy for bonuses for 400 managers. Today, at United Airlines, there is a big fight going on. Unite Here Local 23 is here, 
and they are part of that fight. They are from the United Airlines kitchens. <laughs> These kitchens were outsourced long ago by the airlines in order to have contract workers do this work, right? In order to suppress those wages and deny people the ability to organize, to think that. There are a lot of languages spoken in these kitchens, and you know that when these workers filed for an election, the company said, oh no, there's interference here. You've got to investigate this interference because they speak so many languages they couldn't possibly understand what they were signing when they were signing their unique card. <laughs> Racism is alive and well in the corporate world. And Trump's National Mediation Board awarded them the right to have this investigation that is holding off that election. But I think there's some members of Local 23 here that say they're not going to give up and they're going to keep fighting until they get their election at United Airlines. <laughs> when things are so bad, and there's nothing left, there's nothing to lose. People are willing to stand up and fight. Right here in Ludlow, people are willing to take their families to live in tents, to live on nothing, to weather violence and gunfire. There was nothing left to lose. Pitting people against each other is the specialty of those with money and power. The Colorado National Guard was filled with people who had families too. The government was against us for sure, but once the employer became the one paying the wages all pretenses of neutrality went to hell. More than 100 years ago, Frederick Douglass told us all what we need to know today. He said, the difference between the white slave and the black slave was this. The latter belonged to one slaveholder. The former belonged to the slaveholders collectively. <laughs> Both were plundered, and by the same plunderers. The white laboring man was robbed by the slave system of the just results of his labor because he was flung into competition with a class of laborers who worked without wages. The slaveholders blinded them to this competition by keeping alive their prejudice against the slaves as men, not against them as slaves. Today, the efforts to privatize government functions are more attempts to allow corporations to control the narrative and control the system. Just last month, they tried to privatize security at Orlando Airport, the fourth largest airport in the country. I testified at the hearing to say that we could not privatize security. I said the names of my friends, Amy K, Michael, Jesus, Marianne, Alicia, Al, Amy J, Catherine, Robert, because I was so sick that morning, I didn't think I could raise my head to testify. But I said their names over and over again. These were the flight attendants who died on flight 175, the flight I had worked the week earlier. My friends, security had changed to define the, the government's role in security rather than, than a function of the airlines going to the lowest bidder to perform the security function. My friends died. And by God, this country will not forget, and this country will not forget love law. The only check against corporate greed, the only chance we have to defend our laws and the promise of America is for all of us, and for all of us to be free, is to love our families by loving our union. We need to welcome every gender, race, culture, and creed to our unions. As workers, we have a sisterhood and a brotherhood that crosses borders. And solidarity is everything. It is unconditional power, hope, family, and it can break through every struggle. It is a force stronger than gravity, and solidarity will win. The teachers of West Virginia, with no right to strike and no right to bargain, won on the sheer force of solidarity. The Association of Flight Attendants pledges solidarity with all of you. Flight attendants fly to every corner of the earth when some can only dream of crossing borders. Our work is the very symbol of freedom, and we have more contact with the public than any other work group. Don't tell the corporations, they're already afraid of us. But we have more contact with the public than any other work group. We have a responsibility to connect people, to tell the story of Ludlow, 
and every struggle of workers. We know this, and we are here to tell you that that is our solemn vow. And as we fly over this country, we say with you, this land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. In the shadow of the steeple, I saw my people. By the Greenleaf office, I see my people. As they stood there hungry, I stood there asking, Is this land made for you and me? Nobody living can ever stop me as I go walking that freedom highway. Nobody living can ever make me turn back. This land was made for you and me. One more time. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to New York Island. From the good forest to the Gulf Street to join the staff and he's done a tremendous job there uh, from Socorro, New Mexico, uh, uh, Carlos Carrillo. Uh, one thing I do want to announce, and I'm sorry I haven't announced it so far, but uh, one of the uh, our representatives that's here every year and does a, a good job speaking is uh, our international uh, vice president with District 22 uh, Brother Mike Galpez uh, could not be here uh, today. Uh, I don't know how many people knew this, but Mike Galpez had lost a daughter about two months ago, uh, unexpected death, and it's really taken a toll on him and his family. But uh, this week, he, uh, his brother lost his son, and uh, Mike was unable to attend for that. And, and uh, he does send his well wishes and stuff, and uh, he would. Uh, you know, he misses the opportunity to come here and speak. Uh, also, uh, the work with Mike's staff, and we work together trying to uh, let this union flow and provide representation. A couple of gentlemen, uh, also from the Navajo Nation, uh, uh, Brother uh, Phil Russell. <laughs> and also a gentleman that came from, uh, from us through uh, the Deserado Coal Mine uh, Local Union, uh, 1984. He represents uh, uh, most of the miners and, and workers on the, the western part of our district, uh, uh, Richard Morgan. Uh, also with us today is uh, somebody that kind of keeps me in line uh, uh, and uh, keeps things going. and. Uh, you know, one of the things she should have announced is that she's, we also have members here from OPIEU Local 2, and that's uh, my uh, administrative assistant, Desiree Valdez. <laughs> also with us today from uh, our award-winning uh, publication, our United Mine Workers Journal, 
uh, does a tremendous job in, in uh, keeping the uh, information flowing between our membership, uh, uh, Missy Hunt. And somebody that I always forget to introduce, and, and uh, you know, and I'm going to take the time to, to introduce her, probably my better half, uh, uh, my wife, uh, yeah. Becky. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it definitely is an honor and a pleasure to introduce uh, the, our next speaker. Uh, this is a gentleman that uh, gave me my opportunity to uh, be a part of this labor movement and, and to play the role that I do play. And uh, you know, I, I can never thank him enough, uh, you know, for what he what he's done for for me personally. But uh, this gentleman. Uh, he does not know the words easy way out. <laughs> he doesn't know what that means. Uh, he is president of the United Mine Workers of America. Yeah. And uh, for uh, many mornings, he woke up, and his words, the information that he got is, uh, you have 12,000 members that just lost their health care through bankruptcy. You have uh, another 2,000 that lost their health care through bankruptcy. You've got another 3,000 that lost their health care through bankruptcy. And this was, uh, this was on his plate. You know, and like I said, uh, uh, you know, there's no, you can't go to YouTube and type in how to fix this problem. Because there's a video. So you gotta you gotta figure this out and learn it yourself. And uh, like I said, this guy doesn't know the words easy way out. Um, Sarah touched a little bit on bankruptcy. When your company files bankruptcy, you are the lowest on that pecking order of how it goes. You know, of course the big dogs are gonna get the, their better share of the money. But when it comes down to contracts, you know, your, your contract is null and void. And so you're left out there holding, holding the bank. Generally speaking, they go into bankruptcy court. The judge, they present, uh, you know, this BS contract to the judge saying, well, we could live with this. And generally speaking, in the bankruptcy court, they wrap that gavel and says, that's what you get. And uh, you, we had a corporation, two corporations actually, it was a Peabody Coal Company and Arch Coal Company that, uh, you know, they were going to run around us. So what they did in this country is they set up this, basically this dummy corporation and they put all of their basically liabilities into this company in very few assets, knowing that you know, it's going to go belly up. And so this company, and, and they basically got to stay in business five years, so that's why they give them a little bit of assets to do that. But at the end of the day, that company or those companies said, you know, that's it. And they said, we're not going to give you nothing. And like I said, this gentleman doesn't know the what easy way out. So he when that bankruptcy judge told him, this is your contract, he said, I don't think so. <laughs> and when that corporation told him, we're not going to give you no money, they, uh, he said, I don't think so. <laughs> and uh, at the end of the day, we've got, we got an agreement we can live with, our members can work under, and he put together not only this, but a fight with the government, to give his miners uh, health care. And in the meantime, that corporation that said, we don't owe you nothing, gave him $400 million. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, it's been my pleasure and honor for working with this gentleman, and I hope to continue in that role. But would you please stand up and give our international president, Cecil B. Roberts, Well, all I can say is, Bob, 
after that introduction, you have got a great chance to continue working with me. Um, Bob, if you'd come back up here, I, uh, I'd appreciate it for a second. As Mike Romero, would you come up here for just a second? What, what I always try to do is tell the truth to the extent I can. Uh, sometimes you can't because the judge can put you in jail. You know how that works. Um, but I just want to thank uh, Bob and Mike, uh, if I might. When we all leave here today, there's going to be two, two people stay here uh, every day for the next 364 days. And all these programs that Bob talked about uh, that the government's helping us with, I want to thank the government. It only took you 94 years to get around to uh, recognizing what happened here. And we're very appreciative of it, but that wouldn't have happened without these two. Uh, they put their heart and their soul into this. They call me when something's wrong here, so we might need some money to fix this. We might need to do A, we might need to be to B. But I want you to understand something about this. This monument was not built by the United States government. It wasn't built by the state government. This didn't come from the top down where they tell us what really happened here. This came from the United Mine Workers Treasury to begin with in 1918 when they opened this. And we said uh, when this happened, when I say we, uh, our brothers and sisters who were here, See, we're never going to forget this. And I want to thank you because you are part of the 104th celebration of the wonderful people who fought and died here and stood up for us so we could have a way of life that we have right now. And that's what this is about. And these two people are getting credit for a lot of this. You know, uh, I've met a lot of educators in my life, and I'm friends with a lot of educators. I'm friends with a lot of people who understand our history. But I want you to understand something, Doctor. When you went through this, it wasn't just something she learned from a book. Because I didn't think it was coming from her mouth, quite frankly. I thought it was flowing from her heart when she was talking about what happened here. And we need people like her to continue this research and to continue to tell this story. And I want you to give her another round of applause. <laughs> and I'd like to, if, uh, if our friends who work so hard to see that the statue of, of, of Louis Ticus was put right in the middle of Trinidad and he's standing there uh, looking over the entire town and keeping an eye on all of us now. Uh, by the way, he was only 28 years old when he was murdered. Uh, by, and he became a citizen of the United States of America in 2013. In 2014, the government murdered Louis Tikus here. Uh, and his memory will always be in our hearts. We have not missed an opportunity here uh, to speak uh, about Louis Tikus year in and year out because he was the leader of the Young Mine Workers here at the Ludlow uh, camp. So I like our two friends that worked so hard uh, to see that Louis uh, Tikus was recognized and his statue is standing down there in Trinidad right now as we speak. Would y'all come back up? I'm going to clean it up just a little bit. What did I learn about that documentary? 
I asked my corporal who I'm riding with, uh, what was the lesson of the day? I said something a little stronger than this in the carpool, but if you don't know the history, uh, the National Guard, which was really the employees of, uh, of the company, they were driven out of here after this, chased clean out of here by mostly the Greeks. And I said, don't F with the Greeks is all I can tell you. <laughs> By the way, I, I have become uh, acquainted with this family, the Louis Stigas family, uh, from all the times that they have visited with us. The, the Lewis's family and any other uh, descendants of Lula who might be here, if you would stand, let's give them another uh, show of appreciation. come back up here if she doesn't mind. She told me she could sing and I never believed her. <laughs> so I guess she was going to prove it before she got out of here. Uh, let me tell you something she did not tell you. But what in the world would a flight attendant have in common with a coal miner, right? Well, we're all workers for one thing. We should never forget that. We're, your fight's my fight. Whatever you're doing, I need to stand up for you in solidarity and unity. That's what the labor movement is supposed to be about. But at the AFL CIO Executive Council meeting about a year ago, we've been in this fight trying to pass legislation to, pass, to preserve our health care and our pensions. We passed this, of all things, in the Senate Finance Committee. We know it's dominated by Republicans. <laughs> If it would be called for a vote, if we would win, of course we can't get a vote, right? That's how democracy works when the other party's in power. But she, unbeknownst to me without asking, she asked and made a presentation and put a motion on the floor at the AFL-CIO Executive Council of 50-some unions representing 11 million workers. This flight attendant read about this struggle, understood that we could pass pension legislation to preserve 107,000 coal miners' pensions, that we could preserve their health care. And she made a motion on the floor of the AFLCO Executive Council and said, we need to make my workers' pensions and my workers' health care, the number one priority of this AFL-CIO, and it passed unanimously, and on the heels of that, we were able to secure the health care guaranteed by the United States government for 22,600 UMWA members and their dependents who had lost their health care in a bankruptcy whether it was a Peabody Arch or Patriot, there's been 50 of these, by the way. And we now have our health care because of standing together and solidarity and unity of this labor movement. But this lady who had absolutely no direct interest in this said, that's my fight too. And that's why she is a dear friend of the United Mine Workers. And by the way, the first recipient of an award called the Mother Jones and Mother Blizzard Award. Mother Blizzard was my great-grandmother, was the best of friends with Mother Blizzard, and she led the strike in 1912 and 13. I'm going to talk about here in a minute. And they chased some of these people down the road with umbrellas. So she is as well known in West Virginia as Mother Jones. So she's going to get that first award and voted unanimously by the United Mine Workers of America. And I wanted to say that this is like testifying in church, by the way. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tell me, but I'd like to be at where you are. I want to talk about you for a minute. 
if you don't mind, you, part of the labor movement that's here today. And quite frankly, I think this is kind of like the real labor movement here to a certain extent. We're out here and where it's happening. We're here honoring those people who's gone before us and thinking about those people who gave their lives for us, right? So one of the things I'd like to do as a start, and there are people here that if they had not done what they had done, uh, giving us freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and, and risking their lives for us on the battlefields of America and serving in the armed forces, you know, the other side always claims something from us, don't they? They, they, they claim patriotism, and they, they, claim, they, they claim God. They don't deserve either because God's on our side in these fight. Because God blessed the United Mine Workers of America, and the labor movement has been touched by the almighty hand of God because we do God's work. That's what we do, as opposed to the folks on the other side who might try to oppress workers across this nation. We're not the ones that are taking kids and, and away from their parents. There's folks on the other side knowing that. So every battle that's ever been fought by the labor movement has been fought for justice and fairness. So I think uh, God's on our side on those issues. And by the way, I think patriotism, I want to show you right now, all of you that are veterans in here, please stand. If you're standing, hold your hand up. Don't sit down. Please don't sit down. Stay standing. That's the best bad grammar I know that's a professor. So uh, remain standing. Uh, now, if you are here today and you're in your in your seat and you have a son, daughter, granddaughter, nephew, somebody in the military right now serves in, serving in the armed forces of the United States, if you'd stand, we'd appreciate that very much. <laughs> Father, somebody in your family fought World War II, Korea, World War I, Vietnam, in the Middle East. If you're here today and any of your family fought and stood up for the United States of America and our country and our Constitution, you're here today standing and we would like to recognize you. Now, I love this. I want you to look around. I want you to look around at this. And you ought to take a picture of this. And quite frankly, the people on the other side of these issues ought to take a picture of this. We are the most patriotic people in the world because we fight the wars, we do the battles, and we win all the medals. So that the corporations can make millions of dollars off of us. We are the patriots of the United States of America. We were the patriots in 1914, and we're the patriots today. And don't let anybody like Sean Hannity tell you any different than that. Thank you, just for Now I just talked to you about the conditions that led up to this fight, and they weren't just here. You know, we fought a civil war in this country to end slavery. But I want you to know something. Slavery existed in the United States of America in 1890 in every coal camp in the United States of America, brothers and sisters, because if you are working for somebody and you have to live in their house and you have to pay them to live in that house, and you have no other choice, and they own a store, and you got to go to that store, and you've got to shop at that store, and you don't get paid in American currency, you get paid with company currency. Can you imagine if you were working somewhere today, and you were working at United Airlines, and they said, Sarah, we're not going to pay you in American currency, we got our own United currency here. And we got a store in every airport, and that's where you're going to shop. Something tells me that wouldn't go over very well with the folks working for the airlines. But every coal company, every coal company had their own money. And you had to use that money to shop in their store, and their prices were ridiculous. So at the end of the day, when you got through shopping at their store, and you got through paying to live in their house, and you were working 16 hour days, there was only one way for you to make it, and that was to take your seven and eight, nine, 10 year old son and put them to work for the coal company. So you're talking about child labor and abuse of children? That ran rampant through every coal town in the United States of America. And they had their own police forces in every one of these coal camps. And you got out of line, you got beaten, and you got evicted, and you got blackballed, and you never worked again 
in the coal camps of this country. That is exactly what the conditions were everywhere in the United States of America. And there was no one, no one on the coal miners' side. So the coal miners decided to make their own organization and they made their way to Columbus, Ohio in 1890 and they formed what became the greatest union in the history of the world called the United Mine Workers of America. And there was 20 some languages spoke of those. That was a union of immigrants that built the United Mine Workers of America. So when people, when I go around the country and some of our members say, I don't know where I stand on this immigration issue, well, I know where you ought to stand because some of your great, great grandfathers were immigrants that came to this country. That's why you ought to be standing on your feet in the side of this immigration battle for the people who want to be citizens of this country. They want a life like we got, but that's exactly what we wanted. When we lived in this country, had come to this country, and the other issue here is you were probably safer on the front lines of every war ever fought by the United States of America than you were in a coal mine in the United States of America. Because the employers thought more of you in those mines than any man working in those mines. In those days, the story told time and time again, the boss would look at the worker and say, don't you put that mule under any bad top now. Don't you dare. You take care of that mule. And the coal miner said, what about me, Mike? What about me? And you know what they were told? We got to buy that mule. We can hire another man. They didn't care how many people were killing these coal mines. The record of this industry and the record of this government trying to protect workers was non-existent. You would go to work and you may not come back. And when you lost your job, do you know what happened to your widow and your children? They were evicted immediately. When you were killed, you were kicked out of the company house. That's how workers were treated. In some ways, in some ways, we didn't have anything to lose because we were dying in the coal mines. We were slaves in the community. Our kids couldn't go to school. We had to listen to the company preacher tell us how God blessed the Rockefellers and how God loved the business folks, but maybe didn't love us. How in the world could that be in existence? The Constitution of the United Mine Workers said you can't discriminate. This was written in 1890. I want you to think about this. 1890, you said you can't discriminate against anybody because of race, creed, color, national origin, where they pray, how they pray. You couldn't do that and be a member of the United Mine Workers. We didn't believe in a ten. Because those workers understood something. And what was it? If you don't stand together and you don't fight together, you'll never win. But if you stand together and you plan together, you can whip anybody that's standing in front of you. And this union, this union struck fear in the hearts of the rich up on Wall Street. It struck fear into the White House. It struck fear into the government and Congress. This union struck fear everywhere because workers were reaching out for one another and saying if we can get together, stand together, fight together, we can beat them. And that was true. That was true. But you know what happened? They said, this is not going to make it here. They said, we will fire you. We will evict you. And if need be, we'll kill you to break this union. So from 1890 to 1935, it was a 
pure fight in the trenches. And I want you to understand the tents that the Ludlow Strikers slept in, they came from West Virginia, where I'm from. The 1912 1913 UMWA strike at Paint Creek and Cameron Creek, where all those folks were evicted in 13 and 14. And that's where the Baldwin Fels thugs came from. They came to Paint Creek and Cameron Creek first. The machine gun that was shot here came from Cameron Creek and Paint Creek. So Baldwin Fels thugs made her way here. The machine gun made its way here. The attitude and the methodology that was used made its way here. We had already felt that. Martial law in West Virginia. And people in set right straight to prison. Not even with a pill. And locked up because they just wanted to shoot. I want you to know there's a lesson right there. Workers in West Virginia, and workers in Colorado, and workers in Mexico, and workers all across the United States, they need to stand together, fight together, and turn back these oppressive attitudes of this government today, just like what happened in 1914, brothers and sisters. We need solidarity today and unity today like no other time in our history. Their lives 
were alive. They understood that they might die. They understood that they might not make it to the winter. The kids could have frozen to death and starved to death just as well as they could have been shot. I don't know what kind of a man will put himself behind a machine gun and shoot into a tent colony and rip those tents apart and then walk off of this heat and set those tents on fire and burn 13 women and children alive. There was a 12-year-old boy that stood up in the middle of all this and he got killed by the machine gun. Got cut all the pieces. So Louis Tinkus gets struck across the head and he's laying on the ground and they shoot him in the back and they murder him. These women and children get burned alive. Now we're going to do something right now. And that is, I want everybody to stand. And we're going to shut her eyes. I got more to say here in a moment. But we're not leaving here today. Not one time are we going to leave here today where we don't give at least a minute to these people who died here for us. And then we're going to talk about what that meant for us. I want you to shut your eyes. I want you to think hard with me. And I want you to imagine these families the day after Greek Easter here. And then the machine gun start. At the end of the day, there were two of them firing here. Can you imagine the kids screaming? The mothers holding their babies, trying to cover them up. Mothers running with these kids and getting cut down. Twelve-year-old boy standing up and gets shot with a machine gun. Later in the day, they walk off this hill with kerosene. They pour it on these tents. They light it. Don't you know they had to hear these women scream? These babies crying. You know they could have saved them, but they chose not to. They hated Louis Tika so much, they broke a gun over his head and put him on the ground and then shot him three times in the back. This, brothers and sisters, is our history. And if we ever forget it, we'll repeat it. I, for one, never intend to forget it. I'll forget it when I'm gone. But I read something looking at the statue of Louis Tikus and it said, Death is not the end. Death is the beginning of eternity. We still remember these families. We still remember Louis Tikus. We still remember what they did here and what was done to them. We thank God at this moment for their souls. We thank God for touching them. And we know that God has touched them. And He's touched the United Mine Workers in a very powerful way. Thank you so much. God bless all of you. Please be seated. I have to be careful because I've got a historian up here, but I argue quite frequently with historians about Ludlow, the Blair Mountain March, about how we won. True if you said, what did you win here because people died? Do you know what Mother Jones said? When she gathered everybody together, after Ludlow and after uh, Paint Creek and Cabin Creek, he's pretty excited. Uh, <laughs> this is what Mother Jones said, and if you don't remember anything else, remember this. She said, "Sure, you lost. Sure, you lost. But they had bayonets." And all you had was the Constitution. And any battle between bayonets and the Constitution, the bayonets will win every time. Then she said, 
But you must fight. You must fight and win. You must fight and lose. But beyond all, you must fight. So when you get down and say, well, we lost this fight, get back up. Because that's what happened here. Do you realize 21 years after Ludlow, the United Mine Workers of America was the largest union in the United States of America 21 years later? We took United Mine Workers money and said, this is not good enough that we have lots of members. Everybody needs a union. That was what the United Mine Workers said. John L. Lewis said, we need something called the CIO. And we're going to organize the auto workers. We're going to organize the steel workers, the rubber workers, the textile workers, the communication workers of America. And it became the greatest organizing force on earth. And people who worked for a living had a voice in the workplace for the first time ever. Because of the strength of this movement in Detroit, Flint, Pittsburgh, all across the United States, the power of organized labor coming from Ludlow in 21 years, and we went out and we did what? We built the middle class. So as we go around the country and indeed the world, Tell people about the folks of Ludlow, these non-union people who think that the CEO loves them, that gives them all these benefits. You should look them dead in the eye and say, brother, sister, before you take another breath, you should go to Ludlow and see the monument. That's how you got what you have right now.
might be the speed too much longer after that. <laughs> A couple of announcements. One thing that uh, that happened this past uh, well, a couple of weeks is that uh, the county commissioners here in Los Angeles County did uh, name this road coming out here to level the Lewis Peters Highway. So, uh, also, uh, we have a person, the Phoenix Lopez, that is also running for county commissioner. Wanted to uh, announce that. Uh, stay with us today for the, the barbecue. These people serve it fast, so the line will, line will be long, but it goes fast. So uh, please go and, and get in line and get something to eat. And I do want to thank each and every one of you for coming here today. Uh, this service would be nothing without you. And uh, thank you for being here today. And uh, the last Sunday in June next year, we hope to see you again. Thank you very much. Lives were cheap in Colorado, and coal was king in 1910. And in the deepest coal mine's darkest shadow, there was no justice for the working men. Miners died in cave-ins and explosions because the safety laws were not applied. For profit mattered more than the lives of all the poor And every day another miner died And the coal was black and the blood was red And miners that dared organize always wound up dead And in those days of anger a man of peace arose And words were the weapons that Louis Ticas chose in Walsenburg, in Ludlow, and in Sopris, and 30 other towns, they joined the cause. <laughs>